So your very first Zumba class was one person showed up. Fast forward 12 years down the line, you have created dance fit. Every day, 30,000 people show up in curl gyms. Only thing that's stuck in my head, I'm like, I can make a difference in a person's life. I think I always ran to work to find my comfort there because I didn't get that at home. India is really ready to take off. But all of that will not matter if half the country's population is not fully participating in it. And it's only after I brought fitness into my life that I felt so comfortable in my own skin. I felt so confident of who I am. A big shift in my head that happened after winning that first CrossFit Open. I'm like, I'm so much more than I think I am. Hello, I am Mukesh Bansal. Welcome to Sparks. Our guest today is Shutambri Shetty. Shutambri is among the top fitness trainers in the country. She started her career as a banker. At some point, she became one of the leading master Zumba trainers in the country. Her entrepreneurship journey started in 2014 when she started Tribe Fitness. Tribe was one of the first few multi-format group fitness centers in the country. She joined hands with CureFit in 2016. Since then, she has been leading all dance fitness formats at Cult. In 2018, she created DanceFit, which is Bollywood-inspired fitness format, which has now become the most popular fitness format in the country. Shutambri does amazing job of balancing her own personal fitness journey, her family obligations, and her commitment at work. She is among the fittest women in the country. She has multiple times placed among top 5 fittest women in India, scoring as high as top 3 in CrossFit Games. In this episode, we talk to Shutambri about how she manages it all. She talks to us about her entrepreneurial journey, the challenges she faced as a woman entrepreneur in the first few years, how she got a lot of support from people around her. She talks to us about how she shapes her fitness journey, what fitness protocols she uses, how she continues to be super fit and continues to reinvent her fitness regimen. She talks in a lot of detail about everything that is relevant for women fitness, including the importance of strength training. I found this conversation super informative. I hope you find it very useful as well. Hi, Shitamrish. Welcome. Mukesh, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be talking. Yeah, I'm really glad you know, we're getting the opportunity to sit down and talk. You know, we obviously worked together for the last seven years. Um, known you, but never really got an opportunity to sit down and talk. So today I get to really grill you. Pretty and get to ask thing. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm totally looking forward to it. It'll be fun. Thanks so much. Yes. So have you always been into fitness? Like when did your fitness journey start? Uh, with my father at the age of six. Oh, wow. So there's a family tradition. You guys still yeah. family. Honestly, my dad um, was a sports personality, but he primarily got into fitness mm -hmm. because he was diagnosed with diabetes very early. Right. I think at the age 35, mm -hmm. he was diagnosed with diabetes. That's because of a sudden shift from a super active right. lifestyle to a sedentary lifestyle. Right. Because in his time, it was more about focusing on, oh, you got a great job at the bank, so I have to give it my all. So he was a tennis player, multiple things, moved into sedentary lifestyle, got into like, you know, a little more drinking and eating out, that converted to diabetes. So he had to start fitness very early on, um, started with yoga and a lot of walking, jogging. So I started at the age of six doing yoga with him. I'm, I wouldn't say it continued, but um, sports was very, very key. I didn't pursue it too much in school because of focus was studies, uh, like it is for most Indian families. Um, but it really helped watching my father right. be so active at such a young age. Right. So you were from the age of six onwards, you were active, you know, you were... Dance. Dance was primary. Yes. Go to Dance primary. and sports. And I did a lot of athletics. I did a lot of running mm -hmm. throughout school and college. I used to participate in, you know, state level, inter-school, all of those, like most kids do, I'm guessing. But running and another forte, which I think today why I love weightlifting is I loved short put. Very few women would do short put at in school. And I don't know, I, for some reason, I took a liking to that sport. But what age did you start short put? Mm. <laughs> I can't remember clearly, but I knew I, I think we seventh or eighth standard. Right in school. Uh, that's when in school in school I used to participate in competitions right. and etc. And of course I did pretty much I did volleyball, basketball, 
Coco. I used to be the Coco captain. Yeah. So today when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I used to love sport. Like, right. why didn't I pursue my career in that? And I keep asking my father this question. Like, you know, if you had allowed me to, maybe I would have got a medal for the country. <laughs> you know, because I loved it so deeply. Uh, but yeah, long story short, it was a part of my life, Mukesh, right from the age six. Um, and I think it became my career. Now. And so, you know, in from age six onwards till now, was there any period where you took a long break from active lifestyle or it has always been part of who, who you've been? Honestly, I don't remember a single year being away from movement because when I started my career at HSBC, yeah. that was pretty much my first job right. uh, and last because after that it was all into fitness right. and cult. Throughout my stint at HSBC for seven years, I danced. Mm -hmm. Like I was, because every corporate has a right. lot of this cultural yeah. thing, etc. So I took very keen interest and literally from the first year of being there mm -hmm. until the last year, I was dancing and I had a team of, you know, people who would do right. it with me. So movement was constant. Right. I don't think I remember stopping at any point. Okay, let's go a little bit further back. You know, where where were you born? Where did you grow up? Like, what was your early childhood like other than, you know, yeah. being very active from the age of six? Uh, from a, a town called Kundapur. Okay. It is in, from Mangalore, it's like a two hours drive. Today, I can call it a town. It used to be like literally a village back then. Sometimes I owe my, um, you know, genet, like owe a lot to genetics because where I come from, or the family that I come from, a lot into farming and all of that. So I've grown there briefly, very briefly for about two, three years, actually yeah, about three years. And then we started moving to different cities my, because my father was a banker. But I honestly uh, grew up with the belief that I have to study X number of years and then I get married and I probably have two or four kids <laughs> and live happily ever after sort of a... Uh, and that's how, I mean, they allowed all of us to study. But most of, like my cousins, I noticed, they've done like engineers or doctors or whatever they've done. No one's really pursuing it, you know, through a career or a job. And which is how even I grew up. Mm -hmm. And then my studies was very basic, Mukesh. I just finished my BCom and then I wanted to do my MBA. Right. But my father th thought that I should just stay back and not really focus on all that. So when I, today when I see myself and where I brought myself, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's the opportunities that I grabbed or what it was or some amount of luck and a lot of hard work. Right. But I know it's not typically my education, right? My education hasn't brought me so far. Of course, with all due respect to education, I'd, I'd love to study more, but my parents, my entire family just wanted to get me married the moment I finished uh, BCom, which was at whatever, 21 or something. And it started then. And I was like, it's okay, you know what? This is how my life is and I'm okay. I wasn't exposed to a lot. Uh, even I think a lot of English, like, you know, good English or grammatically correct English is something I learned over the years on my own. It's not something that I will completely, completely give to my uh, education and etc. So I said, okay, let's do this. And then he said, don't go. I said, I'll stay back. I'll work. And that's how the HSBC happened. And I kept meeting a lot of uh, potential grooms. Right. You know, <laughs> age, age of 21. It, 21. And right. 21 was normal because I had a lot of cousins who were getting right. married at 22, 23 as soon as they finished college. Yeah. Unless they were doing medicine, then, then it's a longer process. Right. So they would allow the <laughs> girl to wait. Um, then my dad's already planning dowry and saving up, right. you know, from a typical Correct. Indian middle class yes. family. Uh, and it was okay. I was completely okay with the idea of the arranged marriage and I met close to 50 boys. So yeah, I, I did. And Over how many years? From 21. I finally got married around 29. Oh, wow. Okay. Honestly, I, I never wanted to get married right. for a long time. But I did it. But you cleared along, you wanted to. Yeah, I'm like, you know, it's okay. I'll I'll do what you want me to right. do. I mean, I love my parents. I don't, I know they want the best. Right. Um, yeah, so it went on and I loved my job right. at HSBC. I thought that was the best job ever. It was my first. Right. So I enjoyed it thoroughly. I grew while I worked. And that's really where I learned what it's like to be working or working with like big group of people people management, mm -hmm. 
And the first time I actually got, I, I got awarded as business leader of the year in one year. And I was shocked and I'm like, am I even capable of doing things like this? It, it blew my mind and I'm like, yeah, maybe I'm amazing with people. Maybe, you know, that's, that's my forte. And then I, when I translated to even at cult, right, with trainers later on in life, I realized that's pro probably my favorite. Right. About three years ago, you became mom at the age of 40. And you were super fit, you know, by the time. From what I understand, you continue your, work, your, your fitness routine pretty much all the way, like very late into your pregnancy. Yes. And came back to fitness again, you know, super. really super fast after, you know, delivering your kid. You know, your daughter is doing really well. She's three years old now. So how did you think about, you know, this whole phase of, you know, getting pregnant at that age, yes. taking care of fitness and having a really healthy pregnancy and delivery? Yeah. Um, honestly, Mukesh, I want to start with saying that uh, having a baby at 40, I think physically and mentally is not easy and it's not something I'm going to promote or propagate. Uh, because, you know, women listening to us shouldn't feel like, oh, you can com continue to focus on your career. I mean, it's all very... Um, you have to make those choices. Mm -hmm. I think for me personally, the fact that I kept a check on my health at every point, right. um, continued to be, you know, focusing on my exercise, focusing on eating right. I knew that on the outside, I may be, you know, like aging, but inside I was still, you know, very young. My body age, I'm 43 today, but my body age is 31. Today. <laughs> I hope today is not your birthday, otherwise we'll do it differently. No, okay, you're but this year I turned right. 43, but my body age is 31. So when I planned to have a baby, I knew that I'm 40, but my body age was like, right. you know, 30 or 29 or something. So it was very safe for me to make that decision. And I understood these nuances, you know, of checking your body age, you know, your, your health and etc. I don't know today, I'm I'm lucky that Yona was born very healthy. She's, uh, yeah, she's growing up to be fine and great. But I think um, if I look back, I don't know why I made that decision to have her so late. Uh, if there's one thing I could change, it would probably be that. Uh, I would definitely want to, ha would have had her at the age of, 30 or right. maybe but well I think you have the thing track record of defying norms and conventions <laughs> many times so probably this is one of those one of those if I'm not mistaken I think you already started your daughter on her fitness journey as well right yeah so it's very funny Mukesh but she's seen me right you know go for my gym no matter what yeah. and self-care through my exercise every morning her way of uh, showing how much she understands right. is by doing burpees every day burpees every day <laughs> every single You're kidding, day right? She does burpees. I'm not exaggerating at all. I in fact, put a video on <laughs> social media as well. Right. She did 10 burpees. Like I counted for her. Wow. And yeah, she's all up like... Is she like the youngest kid ever in the world to do a burpee? <laughs> like have you checked on the burpees? I've actually not checked is, that. You know. I've not checked that. But I'm like, she can do more burpees than most adults can. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll struggle to do 10 burpees right now if you ask me to do, you know, some... Yeah, she has a strong influence. And she, she asks me when I come back home in the morning or evening. She like, mama, gym today? I said, yes, I did my gym today. When, what, what age did she did uh, her first burpee? Uh, I think after two. Okay. All right. Yeah, about two. Really, but really. Her, her youngest, <laughs> no, the youngest video I have with her is when she was about six or seven months where mm -hmm. she's trying to do a plank with me. I have seen that and, video. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of became a little viral back in the day. Right. So Shitan, what I'm hearing is like growing up and when you're doing your BCom and a small town you come from, initially your you know entire life was geared towards a more smaller town values and the way of being yes. certain things are expected. You know, there was not very high expectation from you or support even for education yeah. or career. It was yes. about get the basic education done yes. at the right age, get married. And probably from there on, you probably a journey of self-discovery must have started slowly, slowly you would have figured out who you want to be, who you are. I mean, obviously, eventually you not only figured that out, you thrived in it, you know, you have created a very unique identity. In fact, you, you know, I can say that you are a role model to a lot of women in the country today. And I would love to, you know, understand that more, that journey yeah. of, you know, how do you slowly from this pretty much doing what was expected of you. Yes. To becoming your own person eventually. Like I'm sure that uh, 
journey would have been slow and long perhaps yes. not even easy at every step of the way yes so love to kind of really understand you know, what went through so let's go back to when you being 21 you were still active at that time you were still dancing yeah yeah that was the only thing that was going great and my oh yeah the other thing was i wanted to learn a lot of indian classical forms of right. dance because dance was something that i was naturally attracted yeah. to apart from you know certain sports my father never allowed me to i love my father <laughs> but he never he he said no you don't need to learn anything any classical any form of dance you can do what you do at home or wherever else and that will be enough having said that when we had parties he would say you should dance <laughs> and i'm like uh, you know i'm just i'm just like actually I'm, i have a little flashback happening in my head right and i'd be so annoyed with him about it but dance was constant and i think that's what's what me where i am to indian parents mean well but sometimes yes. they're full of contradictions yes. and part of growing up is to navigate those contradictions 100% okay yes. i think my entire family looked at me first of all i only you know studied bcom and my sister ended up doing arts right so the whole family of engineers and etc looked at us like how did my parents raise both of us like you know they they don't want to get married early they they are not studying hard enough and uh and then my father was a little bit of an extrovert because he traveled quite a bit you know because of his job so he allowed me to dress up you know like even if i wanted to wear something short all that he was very open about so obviously my entire family had a problem with everything we did until recently when both the girls became fairly successful and everyone's now obviously being very okay congratulations on your success thoughts but it was a very typical i think a lot of women in india go through it and some of us come out of it some of us don't right i think i just got lucky my a big turning point was working at hsbc and what it taught me meeting the kind of women leaders that i met who actually inspired me a lot so that was one turning point for me and then from 21 for 7 years i was there because i felt like this is my world here is where people respect me look up to me you know and and i got a lot of love and respect so right. i felt like i can spend the rest of my life in hsbc so what was your role at hsbc how did so it I, change yeah yeah i started as a simple customer service executive right and and back then this was when 2010 mm-hmm. and got a salary of some 10 12000 rupees right I'm very happy with it and uh, but i moved after like in 7 years i moved up to uh um, AVP which is assistant vice mm-hmm. president uh basically managing x number of projects right. and teams you yeah. know managing a team of like 80 100 people right. and things like that and that happened over 7 years and so i've found you know a lot of respect more than anything right. else and it, yeah and your job was um most of the time was customer facing so you're always interacting with the clients yes clients right. and the team mostly clients right. was more over calls and emails mm-hmm. team was constant right right then right. people right so you were doing this job at hsvc in fact you were enjoying your job there as you said you said you could yeah. put in just spend your whole life there and you were continuing your fitness mostly through dance, dance. or only you dance. were not experiencing things at that point else. only okay. dance and dance was like every day affair not every day but at least three times a week okay and it was a very integral thing right. like i i remember even if we would go out for like a party with yeah. colleagues and etc it would be like a dance party you know oh. what i mean so right it was just movement was dance for me um and then after 7 years i had got this opportunity to work at a health club okay and i was still not married at that time i was still meeting still meeting potential okay. <laughs> and my parents were basically literally every day was high blood pressure day for them you basically converted arranged marriage into dating game for 7 years yes yeah, really like you know <laughs> great hack thanks for making it funny mukesh <laughs> but yeah sounds it, like um, it <laughs> no i remember some really nasty days where i would sit and we would it was it was like this brain dead moment because i'm sitting in front of someone i'm just listening not enjoying that conversation and i go back home and then because i've said no again i've had to hear a year full and then i would cry my mother would cry everyone is crying it's i want to know like how unpleasant. some of those meetings um did you knew like in first few minutes that this is not going to happen and yes. yet you had to be polite and yes. like what is the minimum cut off time that you will still stay 20 30 minutes <laughs> yeah and how will you get out of it 
I mean, at some point, he, he stops talking and then you have nothing to say and you're like, let's move it's on. It's happening very much like interview. I've generally seen a lot of interviews, what happens and there are actually a lot of studies which also prove the same thing is someone walks into an interview, most people make up their mind in the first five minutes. Yeah. And there's so many studies now, the research has also completely backed this up that, um, you know, the way they do these studies is uh, they show first five minutes of an interview yeah. to somebody else and say you guess whether the person was hired or not hired and people are able to very accurately guess you know as much as 90% accuracy yeah. so thing is you know we make up our mind but we still go through the whole process of interview yeah. to rationalize you know validate what we are thinking or looking for some red flags so it looks like you know maybe your something like that the arranged marriage slash dating <laughs> you know experience was it was like too that. intense when I look back now. And in fact, I think it gets very intense and painful when you are kind of okay right. and then the other person isn't. Right. Yeah. So that's when I'm like, okay, this, then I told my parents, I said, you know what, we need to take a break. This is getting very mm. intense. And work kept me going the right. whole time, I think, which is why I probably loved going to the office and just spending more time there. And then very abruptly, I got this offer from a health club mm -hmm. uh, that we would like you to come and you know operate the health club run the health club mm -hmm. manage the health club uh, it, it, and Zella doesn't exist anymore but it used to be yeah there. Zella was the go-to place in Bangalore yeah. I think 10 12 years ago right yes. but how did they got to know about you and considered you given that you were working in the banking space yeah so through my sister mm -hmm. because my sister was working in the retail space okay. she had a lot of connections so the founder of Zella mm -hmm. knew her and in the course of that conversation, he figured what I did and then that's how it came. And for me, it was a huge, huge move because here I am very comfortable or we can even say complacent. And I'm like, do I even have it in me to make that move and do something different in you? I don't know if I was capable enough. Uh, I always have some self-doubt, mm -hmm. um, not 100% confident. And that's why I think I got very comfortable sitting there for seven odd years in. And then um, I took the plunge. I said, you know what, this is it. This is my probably my only chance to see if I'm, I can do something different. So from the banking space, I moved to a health space. But in the health space, I was still managing people and place. Right. Kind of similar to what I was doing here. But Mukesh, seven years of HSBC, mm -hmm. seven months at the health club and I quit. You quit in seven months? It was so tough. Okay, before coming to quit, I think I just want to, what was your role at Zella? No, I was a general manager operation. So you were running the whole center. Mm -hmm. And it was, from what I understand, it was from kind of luxury, it was like luxury fitness center, right? And no. it was uh, uh, in the uh, right Richmond from, Road area, I think, yes, right? Yeah. Right from swimming pool to the most fancy gym to group exercise to a little restaurant right. cafe inside. It was, it was actually the best. Was there anything like that in India at the time or definitely not in Bangalore? Maybe a fitness first. Right. But that too, not in Bangalore at that mm -hmm. point. They're probably in Bombay and Delhi. Right. But the only equivalent was that. So you had all your celebrities of right. Bangalore, you know, mm -hmm. from the movie industry and right. they're coming to this space. So right. it was very fancy. But I joined them at a startup time mm -hmm. and I think I didn't know what I was getting into. Right. From working, you know, like a nice eight, nine hour cushy job to working you know, like seven days a week and that's what health club is about. Like fitness space is seven days a week. I know that now because of cult and tribe, right? I said, you know what, I can't do this. And then just while all of this was happening, I met my current husband. Um, of course, he's not a Mangalorean, he's a Malayali. But my, and I have to tell you the little story there. My friends saw my harrowing experience of meeting so many people <laughs> and going took through. pretty on you. Yeah, and they're like, we are going to get you married. <laughs> so actually, yeah. I met Vivek through my friends. Like they planned our meeting yeah. for us to get married. And oddly enough, we really got along. Right. We got married. It was very difficult. That's to what friends are for. Yeah. <laughs> very difficult to convince my parents. Right. Though, because they're like, after like seven years of meeting people and, you know, uh, of your own community, now you want to go and marry. Right. I would just talk about because I think a lot of women in India go through that. I think, you know, obviously arranged marriage is a big part of the culture in the country. But some level, you know, it also ends up creating that incredible, you know, pressure. I think I've seen my both sister also go through the same process. You know, pretty much your entire 20s went through that. 
what was it doing to you you know from your able to focus on your career i mean even your mental well being like do you recall now like what is the whole experience you know yes. doing to you as a person mukesh the experience is um, very unpleasant more than anything else you do not you do not almost focus on your career right. because you're always in the back of your mind thinking of what next who are they going to you know ask me to especially if you're not prepared for marriage otherwise i'm not saying that you know i think arranged marriages can be fantastic i know of phenomenal relationships that come out of arranged marriage uh, and i was very game for it but i think i always ran to work to find my comfort there because i didn't get that at home coming back home was a little bit of like a traumatic experience i'm like oh my god what am i going to hear from my father so very unpleasant and it's not something that you know i hope the women of today have to ever go through uh, but and it went on for like 6 7 years so i always i didn't obviously seek any therapy at that point despite feeling uh, uncomfortable and claustrophobic with the whole thing but friends were the only people you know that we had the opportunity of talking to but it was unpleasant because it's not just your parents you know it's one thing if your parents are constantly at it right you have the whole family the right. parents siblings right. their spouses everyone's at it yeah so having you know i mean uh, you had your experience you know uh, in this area if there's somebody in the similar age range in 20s and let's imagine uh, you know a woman in what 25 27 ambitious you know wants to do big things in her life and there is this whole you know overhang of that the most important thing in your life at this point is figuring out a suitable husband what is your your advice to that person and perhaps to her family as well how best to navigate that you know that phase uh my personal opinion is you can work on your career you can you know give like 80% to working on your career even while you are actually trying to get married or trying to find it doesn't necessarily have to get so harrowing i think in with me it was very very different also coming from you know the the village or the town i come from it's very different but at 25 to 27 i would say focus on your career i would definitely say focus on your career um these the career part of it mukesh does not just happen like that it right. needs a lot more effort i'm not saying that relationships don't but i feel like finding a person for yourself and uh, all of that just has its time and place right and this is out of my own right. experience so i'm saying give yourself more time with your career between 25 to 29 or 30 and the rest will happen yeah and things that i know in big cities and people who are well educated etc i think especially family you know who also educated things are different yes but if as you go into larger you know broader parts of uh, india like in the smaller tier 2 3 4 towns i think yes. it's probably not uncommon to still find similar environment Same and thing. similar story i think that probably requires just a lot more conversation i mean today the 20s and 30s are very important from career point of view you know india has a huge problem of one of the lowest participation of women workforce it's a uh, nearly rock bottom even smaller than some of neighboring countries true there right? are a number of women who participate true and that is across the educational spectrum even the women who are able to get you know exceptional degrees etc a lot of them still for a variety of reasons opt out of yes. not you know um pursuing a career yes and at, at one level is obviously personal choice but i think you know not having that career not having their your own thing yeah. that you are proud of and having that level of independence leads to many other things also later on in life which i don't even know if it's a personal thing you know because i see a lot of my cousins yeah. today when they look at me they're like we wish we did what you did you know we wish we had that little courage to say you know let me just give this a shot or had that thing of taking a risk mm-hmm. they are most of them are not happy they're happy of course they have great kids and they have a great life right. but they don't know what to do with their life and they're all so well educated far more than me you know most of my cousins i can say 90% of them are engineers and a yeah. small percentage people are doing medicine and stuff but it is sad i mean very few people who've done arts and commerce and stuff right. still manage to do something more meaningful right. in their lives yeah. so i would say yeah 
women should focus especially between 25 and 30 focus on the career the rest will fall into place but the only thing i would mention here is if you are someone who wants to you know start like a family which is have a baby then that can totally happen alongside focusing right. on a career so do not delay that yeah. I think there's a topic, you know, I would love to delve deeper probably, you know, today as well as I think other episodes here in this podcast. You know, one of the whole positioning of this podcast is exponential impact. Yes. We believe, you know, India is really ready to take off. In next 20, 30 years, there's going to be exceptional opportunities. But all of that will not matter if half the country's population is not fully participating in it. Yes. This whole topic of, you know, women participation in the workforce, in entrepreneurship, new opportunities, is extremely important. I think, you know, one of my uh, dear friends is this guy, Neelkan Mishra. He is a you know, top economist in the country. His understanding of what is happening in our society, you know, why is that? You know, it's one thing to say that, you know, historically, culturally, socially, you know, participation has been low. But I think what's a um, little more painful is that it's not changing as fast. It's not like we're saying, you know, unlike GDP growth, you're saying every year 7-8% is growing, it's not like, you know, more and more women, women are coming up and joining, it's still kind of stagnant. Yes. And I think the topic, you know, I would love to understand a lot more deeply yes. and perhaps, you know, spark a conversation and talk to a lot more women who are role model like yourself, you know, who has done a great job of balancing, you know, personal life, family life and a career, in your case, even entrepreneurship. I think that's uh, yeah. desperately needed in India. I totally agree, Mukesh. And something I want to add, um, you know, uh, here is in India, women or in India generally, we have a lot of our support system is strong when right. compared to any other mm -hmm. country, right? Like when I look at my sister, I look at other people living in like cousins living in other countries and when they have babies, I mean, there's zero support right. system. Mm -hmm. I think for women in India, you know, from marriage to baby to career, all that is very easily doable because your support system right. is phenomenal. Yeah. You have your parents coming in, right. you take care of your child. You have your aunts, you have, you can have five nannies if you want. <laughs> right. but I mean, like a good All nannies. for free. Yeah. <laughs> you, the support system is phenomenal. So I would say, you know, women should, with baby, post marriage is still simpler. But even, you know, having one, two, three babies, you can still do everything you want as an entrepreneur or to kind of pursue your career yeah, because the support system is there. Yeah, I think the whole society needs to I think, learn and change their mental model and yes. create a more favorable environment, a lot more role models, a yes. lot more conversations. Yes. But I think for India to realize its true potential yes. is very, very important to unlock, you know, that um, the unrealized potential, you know, that lies among the women. Yes. Something else that came yeah. to my mind now is I think in India, another thing we need to it's starting to change. The fathers or the men need to start supporting the women a lot more. In the sense, my husband, this is an unknown story as well. My husband quit everything he was doing so that because I had a pandemic baby, like peak 2020 July. It was very tough because we didn't have help. My parents are very old because I had a baby very late. Vivek's parents were in Trivandrum, couldn't come and help us. We didn't get a nanny at that point. It, the nanny only came like four or five months later. My husband quit everything he did. No job, nothing. Because he realized I needed the help. And then he supported me for whatever, the six, eight months. And then we shuttled between Kundapur here to keep taking help. And finally, we found a good lady. Not a nanny, but someone who can help us and lived in with us. But here's the thing, Mukesh. When I had to come back after six months to cult, back to my job, my husband said, I'll continue to be the uh, father or full-time father. You go and earn for the house. And I feel like from the time I've married him, it's um, life has changed and it's only gotten better because of the support. Mm -hmm. My parents have always supported me, but the kind of support that I received from Vivek, my husband, has been absolutely unconditional and he's always prioritized my needs. Right far more. Until Yona turned, my daughter turned two years, he didn't work. Right. Yeah. He was there for her. I would wake up at five and go to the gym and I'd come back only like 7.38 because I have a longest proce process yeah, really. for myself and he knows how important fitness is for me. Then he, the one thing he wouldn't take away. He would 
ensure he wakes up, you know, um, when, when the daughter gives her a bath, feeds her. And then we started her daycare slightly early because we had the option, drops her, does everything we needed to do for her in my absence, even when I travel. And I don't know if that kind of support system exists because today, even with a lot of, you know, people who, even in the modernized times, women still tend to say, okay, I'll take the longer maternity break. I will consider staying home for two years and then going back. And my husband was like, I didn't even say it. He's like, I'll quit everything. You know, it's all for a while and we can work harder and earn what we, for the time we lost. But one of us needs to be here with the daughter. You cannot because you have a more important job to do with cult. I can. That's amazing. I think, thanks for sharing. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, very inspiring, you know, what uh, your husband Vivek, you know, chose to do, like fully support you yeah. and the baby through his process, probably, you know, at least put his own career on pause, I guess, for some time Yes. to ensure that, you know, you were able to pursue what you want to do. And I think the point I, mean, I will generate to say that, you know, we don't need to have these things very in a very gender stereotypical yes, manner, right? Exactly. It's ultimately exactly. as a partnership, both people are involved and depending on each individual family situation, like different people can take different roles and responsibilities. And I think we can move past, you know, very stereotypical role of this is what a guy is supposed to do, exactly. this is what a girl is supposed to do, right? And that will be, you know, that mindset change can yeah. I think create a more level playing field and, you know, better equal opportunity environment and support you know for yes okay for everyone i have to tell you this funny thing because my mom would look at this whole situation <laughs> and she'd be like well do they <laughs> what have you done why is he doing this right. i'm like mom how does it matter whether yeah. he does it or i do Correct. and i don't try to reason with her because yeah. she's never going to right. understand because she believes it's my duty right but his mom is looking at it from a very different perspective She's like, this is very impressive to see you do so much. I mean, yeah. and now he calls his mom more often. Right. right. You know what right. I mean? Like he's he's just completely understood what you know having a baby and just managing. Her. His so it's mom, very interesting. His mom is probably thinking, I wish I had a husband <laughs> like him. <it."> so, <laughs> totally. <right. laughs> totally. Yeah. All right. But, so let's yeah. go back to you know your Zella experience. So that was your first time, I guess, uh, immersion into the world of fitness. Yes. What do you still like? What? How does the Zella experience affect you? What did you learn? You know, that I probably didn't like the role, so you quit after seven months, but you know, something about fitness must have, you know. Yeah, that's when uh, I started right. Zumba. Okay. I got introduced to the world of Zumba there. And uh, although I, so the work itself was very hectic, Mukesh, and I didn't enjoy it. I don't think I enjoyed the pressure because I was not used to pressure. Working under pressure was not something I knew what it was like. Today I know. Uh, you know, from tribe and cult and etc. But at that point, I wasn't ready for it at all. Yeah. And then this whole, you know, uh, I'd met Vivek, that was happening simultaneously. So the marriage pressure also was there. So between all that, I'm like, you know, I can't, you know, take pressure at home and take pressure at a job. So I decided to quit. But it brought me to a space where I felt I belonged, which is the space of, you know, people coming in, exercising, working on, because I wasn't going to a gym until then. I was only dancing. So it was a beautiful space to be. I, I completely connected with the space. And then this lady uh, came from the US and she landed there because she's heard so much about Zella. And then she spoke to me because I was managing the space and said that, you know, I want to conduct the first training in the country at your space. And I'd like to give you a complimentary access to that training because uh, we're doing it here and you, you like dance and yeah. things like that. I reluctantly went into that training. This was the Zumba training? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was while I was working there, yeah. but I very reluctantly went there. I'm like, God, okay, she's giving complimentary. There's nobody else who likes dance. Right. So I don't have a choice because mm -hmm. the founders were very particular that I did it. Right. So I went ahead and did it. I enjoyed the two days because it was fun. But I came out of it and I did nothing about it. Right. I just said, okay, I've done a course. Not a big deal. You got you got certified as Zumba training yes, at the time? Yes. Okay, so after yes. two days you were... Yeah, like we have to go through a test and etc. Right. Fairly simple, nothing yeah. complex. Okay. But that's only a two-day process. After that, you have a month's process to mm -hmm. put the whole thing okay. together. So I did all of that. And I think two months after I finished my course, I quit. Uh, but the expectation was that I finished the course, I conduct the sessions, you know. I'm like, alongside this role that I have to play as a general manager, I don't think I can also conduct classes. But 
Then I was very clear. And I quit that place three days before my wedding because the pressure was just mounting. I thought I'll take a month's break, I'll come back, but then it just became impossible. So we were, can I discuss? And he's like, it's okay, take a break for three, four months. You know, you've worked all these years, so it's fine. So I took a break, went home to Kundapur, got married, um, came back, settled into the house. In three months, exactly from the time I got married, my husband reminded me, you had done some course, some Zumba something. Why don't you start, you, you know, start like looking at what it's all about. I did that. I'm like, I had time at home, apart from just doing some cooking for both of us. I'm like, okay. So I started looking at all the DVDs. We used to get it in the form of DVDs uh, in 2010, 2011. Started doing my study. It took up a month to kind of really build that, you know, format for myself. Um, and then I went and conducted my first class at a Pilates studio in Kodamangla. Okay. So I knew the trainer through Zella. Right. And she was like, look, Shwe, they all call me Shwe. So like, nobody knows Pilates. It's mm -hmm. still very niche. But if you do something fun there, right. then the walk-ins will sure. come because of you. Right. And then we can convert them to mm -hmm. Pilates. It went great. It was a small space with, which can only accommodate like 10 people. Yeah. It was a house. Um, it, was, it was amazing because I went for my class. I had one student in my class. And this is a story which most people know. And that for, that student was like, it's supposed to be like a dance thing. It's supposed to be a group, right? Are you sure you want to do one-on-one? -on -one? Right. I'm like, you showed up. So your very first Zumba class was one person showed up. This was which year? 2011. Okay. So we'll talk about it later, but fast forward two years down the line. You have created dance fit. Yes. Every day, 30,000 people show up in curl gyms. Gives me goosebumps. This 12-year journey, right? We in this part, we talk a lot about, you know, this long term. Like you start small and the things that can happen over 10, 12 years, the power of compounding, right? I mean, if I was in your shoes, you know, maybe or somebody in that situation can say one you know, person showed up <laughs> it's just not worth it, right? You go back yes. home and you know, you continue what you cook, cooking and, you know, yeah. you know, and other things and so on, right? But you somehow stayed with this. And I think it's just very, every single entrepreneurial journey I see, it starts so tiny. It's like <laughs> one person dance classes as, you know, uh, lean as it can get, right? You know, it's like different between zero and one. And from one to now, I mean, for cult, you know, dance fit is by far the biggest format, you know, yes. 30,000 people every single day. We must have at least more than a million people must have, you know, done those dance yeah. classes. And I think it's uh, the energy, etc. I think we'll uh, talk about that a lot more detail, but you know, I just couldn't help myself, you know, thinking about you now, here we go again, you know, one more example of someone is starting with just, you know, one person class and eventually, you know, landing on this situation, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, incredible power or somehow you would have you know and uh, not somehow I think I know exactly how yeah. you stayed with the journey and then you eventually end up creating in a massive impact so that was your first class so what was my it? first class and I want to tell you why it stuck forever when I finished the class uh, I saw this lady struggling to do it right but she did it for whatever 30 40 minutes we did it and then um, you know she was really happy by the end and she was smiling year to year. And then she tells me, she's like, this was so amazing. She's like, I'm definitely coming back and I feel good. She's like, with, you know, with my size and et cetera, it's very difficult for me to do any sort of training easily. But this was just like moving mm -hmm. easy and stay in your comfort zone, right. enjoy the music. And she's like, I felt great. And Mukesh, the only, only thing that stuck in my head, I'm like, I can make a difference in a person's life. Right. I was like, if all this while I've been managing projects and managing people, here is an opportunity that has come to me where I can make a person smile. Mm -hmm. I can make a person healthy. Yeah. I can give them a new lease of life. Right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not God. But I'm a simple human being who's able to bring someone joy. Right. I went back home and I told Vivek, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to make people healthy and happy God. in the smallest way. After first class, After you had... I went back home and I said, I'm doing this as long as I can. I'm not going to go back to the corporate world. I'm not finding myself a job. This is what I'm going to do. It, the, the belief in it was so deep, Nukesh, that in no time, I was being called by so many gyms to come and take classes. That's what... I mean, my name just went from one gym to the other saying that 
you know, you should have Shweta come and do Zumba classes. And at one point, I lived in one place. From there, I conducted classes literally um, Whitefield, Koramangla, Indranagar. You right. understand the Bangalore yeah, that is, that's right. geography, right? JP Nagar, I went everywhere. Right. I conducted about three classes a day, three cardio high intense classes. Right. I took good care of myself, of course. But the joy it gave me was immense. Outstanding. I think that's super inspiring. So you had your, uh, that first class, one person showed up, had a profound experience. Uh, this is, you were teaching Zumba. Yes. Can you also explain for the audience what exactly is Zumba? Yeah. Um, it's Latin inspired or Latin based dance fitness right. in, you know, in very, very simple words. So the creator basically, and he has a very interesting story. His name is Alberto Perez. Everyone calls him Beto. Uh, he is from, I think, Cuba. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. But his story is that he he was a small-time aerobics instructor. And one day he just forgot his actual aerobics music. And, and he's from the cassette days. You remember mm, the cassettes? Right, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Not even CD, DVDs. He was in the cassette days. So he had some cassettes in his bag and apparently he just played that for class because mm -hmm. he forgot his actual choreographed aerobics music. And then he did like whatever salsa, all of those kind of, you know, very simple dance mm -hmm. stuff. And the class was like, this is a pleasant surprise. I mean, you've moved away from doing a typical aerobics class. Right. So can we do this more often? Yeah. And that was it. He built on that, moved from a small space. He, I think he his first big move was to Miami. Mm-hmm. He tried to sell his concept. Right. Because he knew in his little space it really worked. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I think I can make this big. So when he moved to Miami, he found it very hard to survive. Right. So apparently he had his days of sleeping on park benches because he didn't have enough money and he was still trying to make a pitch. Yeah. And then just like in my case, a Pilates studio gave me that class opportunity. He got an opportunity at a studio. And they said, like, look, we can take classes. We'll see how it goes. And then we'll see. And from there, he built an empire. Yeah. The world is doing Zumba. Right. In India, it hasn't, uh, it picked up, peaked, and now it's dropped for whatever reason. Yeah, I think we had something, to, we had something to, to, to do with do that. that. We'll talk about that. But, you know, again, one more example. So you're saying, you know, this guy was an aerobics instructor. Yes. Accidentally stumbled upon, you know, leveraging in fun dance as a way of fitness. Yes. Struggled as an entrepreneur, but eventually figured out a way to, you know, create a concept and product out of it. And as you all know, Zumba is world yes. famous. Today, dance fitness yes. pretty much in the whole globe is synonymous with, with uh, you know, Zumba. Yes. Except in India. But yeah, it's just, you know, we had yes. different plans for India. Yes. <laughs> you have a very big role in making had, those plans happen. Yes. But it's amazing his journey. And na now he has like two you know, business partners and the three of them have created a massive empire. They're still very big in US, right. um, apparently also in uh, Europe. Right. But yeah, they, they, they're they at it and they pivoted to online very quickly du during COVID and uh, it worked well in their favor. Otherwise, the trainings were all on ground, like we did the trainings in India across the country. Um, and we saw some great, great, great numbers turn up for, and it, Honestly, Mukesh, actually in India, I must say, when I did it in 2010, the training, end of 2010 and 2011 is when I started classes, I was one of the first instructors in the country. We were like just literally two, three of us across the country. Yeah. In no time, it picked up because everyone was talking about, because there was no dance right. fitness concept back then. Zuma was the first one. It gave a lot of women mm -hmm. and moms yeah. the opportunity to do something. Right. I, of course, was just married, but I know during that whole training phase, because I then became a master trainer for the country. Yeah. So I used to conduct the training batches. Sure. And a lot of our trainings had moms. Right. So for them, they found a flexibility in mm -hmm. managing house, right. their you know family, yeah. and going and taking two classes a day right. and making some you know decent money. So a lot of these stay-at-home moms, they started to become Zumba instructors. Yes. Right. Yes, because the course as such wasn't a very difficult mm -hmm. one, you know, 
you finish the main theory part in yeah. two days, and then in one month you prep the whole class, yeah. like you prepare everything. So it was not difficult as right. such. Plus, in India, everybody believes they can dance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I don't know if I should say this, but we did have trainers who couldn't really, who were not great dancers, right. but still became trainers. Right. Yeah. And, so there you go. Yeah. So just so after you know you um, you said software Zella experience, you were initially working as a freelance. Mm. Zumba trainer. Yeah, for a good two years. And you used to take Zumba classes in a variety class, of clubs yes. in Bangalore mostly. In Bangalore. All in Bangalore. We only did a few events in different cities. Right. But I took classes. What was your schedule like? How many classes per day? So I would start my day at usual five a.m. I'd go take my usual class. five a.m. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's become such a. Um, yeah, of course. So usual five a.m. You know that's as everyone does. Used to see my father wake up early, and I did yoga Ar- with him at earlier than five a.m. No, no, no. Okay. His right. day starts between 4.35. So, I um, conducted my first class between 6 to 7 a.m., 6.30, 7.30. I must add this also. This is back in 2011, 2012. I think I felt um, like, I know people paid me money to come for classes. And at that time, Mukesh, in 2011, I used to charge 3,000 per month for three classes a week. Mm-hmm. Right? And people paid. But I felt like I was obliged in, you know, because I, they paid me money, I have to ensure that they come every day. Right. I would wake them up in the morning. Okay. I would call them while I brush my teeth. I would call, you know, especially the ones who I know are capable of snoozing and going past their alarm. I'd wake them up and there were some members, I would pick them up also on my way because they would then have excuse of, oh, I couldn't find a cab. I couldn't get an auto. I couldn't. Excuses are always there. So I think that's also how I built a very strong community. And all of these people, uh, I would start at 6 a.m., finish my first class, then go for my next class at 10 a.m. to a different area. From Indranagar, I would go to Whitefield, finish my 10 a.m. class, come home, figure out lunch and etc., rest for a bit, go for my evening class at 6 p.m., you know, finish that. So it was like that Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday. And then I would you know, stay home Saturday, Sunday, more like a family thing, you know, spend time with the husband, etc. But um, what I was saying is that, you know, that whole structure of ensuring my people kept coming back. And this is despite having working at three, four different studios. I mean, the people who trained with me then have stuck with me through tribe. A lot of them even came in then to cult. And I still have a connect with them. Amazing. I think I want to, you know, again, you know, emphasize that point, say, so your job was that, you know, people are signed up for 6 a.m. class, they paid their money, you can easily show up. But you are taking the extra care, you know, 30, 40 minutes before of remembering to call them and yeah. instead even picking some, some of the them. folks, you know, which I think is important in so many different ways. You know, on one level, you are dem- demonstrating true ownership for what you are doing. Yeah. It was not about just, you know, getting the job done. You really wanted to, you know, go out of your way do above and beyond what was expected. No one was expecting, you know, they were saying, hey, we expect, you know, to do this for me, right? But I think they're bringing, you know, that attitude to your work, whatever anyone's work is. You know, I've okay. seen time and again, I think it's a small things, but over a period of time, that really matters. And again, I think I'm going to talk to, you know, now the people who are, you know, listening to this podcast and who have interest in impact, you have to, like, I'm sure everybody's going to do some work today. Yes. You can do a bare minimum to get by or you can say, how can I really kill it? Mm-hmm. Like, whatever that small thing, you know, that, little email or small document or piece of code how can i go really above and beyond like you know if you can do this in this way in the fitness i think everybody can do that and True. that thing day after day month after month like you've gone from you know one student to training yes. thirty thousand people every day over 10 because of doing these small things right correct or doing the small things above and beyond every single day i think super important for anyone who wants to do big things in life like yes. start small but able to go beyond is in your hands, right? And you can choose to do that, right? Correct. No one asks you to do this. Nobody, absolutely. And these are some some things about managing people and taking care of them is what I also learned at HSBC, being there for seven years, you know, taking p- care of people's needs, even if they've not asked for it. And I just realized how, like you said, it goes a long way. And they and these are the people who also gave me their first checks when Tribe was opening without even having a building ready because they had so much faith in what you do. Right. So over these two years, you know, you conducted this uh, Zumba classes at you know variety of centers. You build a relationship with people. You build a community. You know, probably I know you stood out as a trainer who really cared 
about the people and probably and I mean, you still bring such enormous energy to the classes i can't even imagine what you were doing your 10 year ago but i'm sure it was probably super fun and super energetic so you did that for 2 years and at some point you decided to start on your own yes so that happened when i actually hurt myself or injured because of excess cardio and my strength training was not at its peak at that point very very minimum or literally nothing um so i hurt my ankle because of excess pressure yes it was yeah it was like that bursitis right. the tendon and the bursa are getting all inflamed all the time so then i had to take a break for 6 months while i took that break i met my ex business partner mm-hmm. right and he took all my classes right. in my absence and he actually did justice because otherwise replacing you know your original trainer mm-hmm. with someone else people do get right. upset and they yeah. even all of that but he didn't justice so he took all my classes in my absence and this was in 2013 right so 2011 to 13 i was at it 2013 i had to take a little break so while i recovered he took all the classes and he and i became really good friends mm-hmm. and then we started discussing about how can we make this a little bigger together right. yeah he was a first one of the first crossfit coaches in the country like right. he went to singapore at that mm-hmm. point trainings weren't happening in yeah. india he did his training came back so we like how are creating a group exercise space which has like crossfit zumba and then we'll bring mm-hmm. in other elements of right. yoga maybe less meals yeah. indoor cycling right and that thought so initially i was like yeah i always wanted to create a niche small boutique space right. and always keep only one space yeah. no expansion right um and cult we don't believe in expansion <laughs> yeah, clearly <laughs> yeah i know i'm like how did i even land here from that thought to this but he he was like you know what let's do this and we spoke about how much money we need to bring in um and i said and thought i'm like how do i bring in the money because i don't have so much money i had made one very smart investment while i was at hsbc at 24 my dad pushed me into buying a house a flat right. close to office mm-hmm. he's like look now your salaries are getting better you know you're also growing in the company take a small chunk put it towards this so he helped me buy a house and i obviously paid for it over the many years uh and at, when i was when i was starting going to start tribe i think the house was already like 7 8 years or 7 years old or something so the value had appreciated So I said how about selling this house because there's no other way to get any money. That was pretty much my only asset except that maybe what I have in the village is different. Uh we took a bank loan which was collateral free because they give you women entrepreneurs a little more privilege with these things. So we put the whole plan together, we understood how much money we need. Um told myself and my husband's like you should take the risk because you know if that doesn't work what are you going to come back and do, right? And I said okay Let's do this and I'll take the risk. So you sold the house. I sold the house. I sold the house and that was said, easy decision. I was um I didn't stay at that house at right, that point. Okay. I'd moved because of the Zumba thing I was doing in many places. Right. So we took up a place for rent. So I rented that house at that point. But it I was connected to that home because mm-hmm. it was my first ever investment. It was a beautiful home um uh, in in JP Nagar right. of course. But it was wonderful. and Vivek and I after marriage that was the first home we stayed so that way I was very connected to it but then I'm like it's only a house mm. and I can buy another house if I make this business successful there's no one else who's going to give me money so I sold the house I got some good money out of it I put that money into the yeah, business so let's do this and that's how the whole journey started and then I'm like okay um we need to make this successful so Honestly Mukesh at that point I was clueless like right. I'm not a business person right I don't understand numbers very well so but good for me that Sudeep was excellent with numbers so he did that part of it what I did was try to research a lot as to what do people in Indranagar need I know I have a studio in Indranagar mm-hmm. I yeah. conducted Zora right. I had set number of people so you know what I did I um put down a questionnaire i printed it and i walked in supermarkets mm-hmm. like i wanted to walk in only certain type of supermarkets which are little more affordable like your nature's basket where a certain type of people come and i went to certain cafes mm-hmm. 
So when I go to, I went to Nature's Basket and I'm like, you know, as people were shopping, I would go to them and I'd be like, can I just walk behind you and just have you answer some questions? Because I'm creating a new fitness space and I really want to, and I don't have money to put into research. You know, like hire an agency and do the research. Most people don't say no to a woman. You know how it is? So I took advantage of that. And I just kept talking to more and more and more people. I went to cafes and approached strangers and I said, look, I want this information. And people really were kind enough to say, happy to give you that information. And I had like a lot of contacts, you know, name, email ID, number. Once a place was kind of, you know, we closed on the whole deal and then I sat and connected with everyone. I sat, I had like two coffee shops that I worked out of. Uh, people came and met me right. over coffee. We discussed what this place is about. People started giving me checks. Right. Saying that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and so, before we, you know, talk more about Tribe, I want to, I think there are, you know, some patterns are emerging from your story and which I think is very relevant for most people who want to start. Hmm. See, one is, you know, you over almost, I think, guessing nine, ten years, you acquired a lot of relevant experience. Hmm. First, in your HSPC job, yes. you learned how to be really good with people, both managing teams as well as client-facing stuff. Yes. Then, you know, you for two years, you uh, got really good at Zumba. You build relationship with people. So, you know, it's a entrepreneurship may or may not have been, you know, your master plan, but somehow you're working towards the other very important thing, you know, somehow you stumbled upon is you know, you invested in this house and, you know, I'm guessing you were paying EMIs, etc., which mm -hmm. became a way of saving and the house price was appreciating. So your startup capital was also available. Yes. These are all, you know, very necessary ingredient. You know, it's an entrepreneur, not about I got inspired today and quit my job, I'm going to start something tomorrow, right? Fully One agree. needs to like prepare for it, you lay the foundation. So in your case, a foundation in terms of skill set, both, you know, client facing a skill set, and the uh, technical skill set in terms of Zumba, you know, it happened over a period of time. Yes. You also somehow, you know, became financially prudent and your dad played a big role in yes. encouraging you to do that. So you had a startup capital and you had some stability so that, you know, by the time you were starting Tribe, it was not like this needs to work in next six months or I go bust, right? Yes. You had created a runway for you, right? And right. which is very important for anyone, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you want to start with one fitness center or you want to have a you know, e-commerce app or anything else, you know, these days, I guess, everybody's doing generative AI startup, doesn't matter, you know, yeah. like, just because it's a cool trend doesn't mean, you know, one needs to jump into it. And that True. preparation time is very, very important. Yeah. That gives you the roots on which, you know, you can then try to build something, you know, very ambitious. So coming back to your tribe journey, so you were hanging out, you know, stalking people <laughs> on these grocery shops and cafes <laughs> and, um, I, okay, and so how, how did that, you know, um, what, pan out in terms of your uh, how long did it take for you to launch your first center yes and then so we took about we started the whole you know work in our head and then on paper in 2013 so i think it was about eight months journey right. from the time we thought of it uh, convinced ourselves brought in the money started the work found a place so we used to go on the bike all over indranagar right. going round and round uh to see which building is empty, which property is available, then walk in and then talk to, you know, whoever is available or go and meet the landlord. We saw many buildings. Um, and then what's, what's, so we finally the building that we got, you know, the, the tribe building today, um, right on 100 feet road, more, most of the other floors have continued to remain empty for the last seven years. Hmm. Okay. And I think now three floors are cult. That's right. a different story. But this landlord is very, very picky on who he gives it right. to. Extremely picky. Mm. Uh, he's like, I'd rather keep it empty, but I'm not going to give it to just anyone. So sometimes I'm like, what happened in that first meeting with this landlord? <laughs> he knew we were absolute startup people. Right. We had pretty much no clue except a little money to give him. And he trusted us fully. Mm. And that property was a prime property. I mean, getting a space on 100 feet road and taking a risk of 4 lakh rent per month. Right. Today, if I have to redo it, I won't take that risk. I'll be more, a little more smart and probably take a place which is 2 lakh rent. Right. I don't know what we were thinking. We were so, I think, full of, like, very enthusiastic about it. A lot of josh, all of that. But everything went well. Okay, So we started in eight months from the planning date. We launched in 2014. Yeah, during those eight months, what was the reaction of your family? Like, 
your father convinced you to buy this house which now you find now you sold and you want to start uh, some fitness center he was not happy about it but he's like i mean you're married now it's between you and your husband right. i can't interfere yeah. right okay you know how yeah. they get into that zone yeah. it's between you and your right. husband and yeah he my husband always supported so there was the family was very clueless and like what is she doing i mean <laughs> fitness for she became a trainer and right. now she's trying to build something they were absolutely clueless some of them came for the launch of the place right uh, so it was sweet but my goal was to i mean the whole presale thing i did sitting at a cafe yeah. single handedly because i was not social media savvy or anything at that point everything was more one on one we had about 108 memberships that right. i sold mm-hmm. single handedly and i was i'm still very proud of it i'm like i remember interning at ibm and ford motors before i got a proper mm-hmm. job at hsbc and that was sales and i was so bad and i'm like i'm never going to sell a product in my life it's <laughs> not my thing and here i was sitting and selling you know right. fitness memberships and i emerged to actually successfully do it so i was very proud so we launched with 108 members uh all some good people of indranagar restaurant owners etc we managed uh, to number is also very interesting you know 108 Su- surya namaskar <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes also, so. i didn't think of him that yeah. at all but right. yeah this this was in 2014 2014 okay that was the first the tribe that came and right. then um yeah i mean obviously both of us didn't take any salary or any money for as long as it was there until the acquisition and etc right uh we just kept run functioning you know as is from month 1 at least we made enough to of course pay back right you know all of that uh, happened we didn't have to worry about that word of mouth marketing non we never really discounted the price in those 2 3 years that we were there we were like this is what it is um we got good numbers trickling in every month could have made it way better had i understood how to run a business mm-hmm. like you <laughs> if you know if i had that kind of business acumen maybe we would have run it way better and instead of having 300 members or 400 members we would have had 1000 members so the place at the capacity i would try to say in ideal world you wouldn't have sold to cult no no Yeah, uh, oh, I would have had a vodka. No, no. I think ideal world. I would have created a much stronger place with right. more members where you would pay more money there. Ah, uh, okay, all right. <laughs> I think we're we'll still paying you. I think we'll last seven years, so no, let's call it even. Oh, but nice. from I, I remember 2014, 15, tribe became quite a place. You know, there were a lot of cool buzz around it. It was, you know, one of the yeah really cool different type of fitness place in Bangalore, especially in Indra Nagar. Yes. What made it that cool? the whole concept of group class mm-hmm. we were a place which is only group class and everything in indranagar was a gym yeah right like the big places were all gyms right. smaller studios did dance classes and zumba and etc but the trainers um the very personalized attention right. and even today i have some like people from tribe who i bump into they like sure it's a small thing like we would stand outside and wait for the class to get over so that we can go in you would just walk by to see if everything is okay and you would just you know put your hand on my shoulder and say how are you this morning you know and i would probably just immediately in 30 second went out my morning and say my kids are giving me this trouble that trouble but because you asked me that and i went it out and i walk into class i felt good they like the very small things that mm. you and your trainers right. did made us feel so good and we always wanted to come back right and of course the classes were great simple yeah um but it was that we were able to keep that personal connect because there was only 3 400 members you know the moment it becomes bigger it's obviously difficult so i'm going to ask you a more of a business question right now is so now you're part of you know leadership team at cult you know as a when you're operating one center you had this deep personal connect yes. with the members do you think we are able to trust that to now that we have 600 centers and how do we do this one every day basis with you know all the now what 1 lakh people walk in how do we you know put a hand on the shoulder everyone say like, oh <laughs> how are you in india but at, but talking about culture right, i think mukesh it's all about the trainers if we um give our trainers little more time to spend with customers within the center not saying outside right um it, it's completely possible to give them that little extra you know how are you how was your day i think we don't have that time and bandwidth at this point because you know we run a lot of classes because we need to make so many slots available for all our people and in the bargain sometimes you know we don't get enough time to like 
shift from one class to another. We don't have enough time with a customer. I think at Tribe it was very different. It was one center. The same trainer didn't conduct back to back classes. Yeah. So it's easy for them to come out and. Yeah, but I think what your point is valid. I think in a service business, you know, maintaining that warmth yes. and, uh, you know, so is is very important. I think all great services businesses do that, even at scale. Yes. I think for us, I'm sure it's a journey and work in progress. Absolutely. But we'll come to that. So we'll now. How were you feeling? You know, you had taken a lot of financial risk, right? You were not drawing any salary, etc. Were there any challenges in that period of 2014-15? Personally, for me, there weren't because my husband, you know, had a good job and he earned well. So it was okay for me. Also, Mukesh, I didn't, like the first year was a little tough. But after that, uh, as a master trainer for Zumba and etc., I did a lot of trainings and events. Okay. I became a Nike brand uh, ambassador like there were certain set of people in India we were about five of us yeah. who represented Nike so we used to conduct classes for Nike so you know we had some sort of uh, money coming in there and then as a Zuma master trainer I conducted trainings I had money coming in so I had something going on but for my partner it was very tough because no salary no other source of income right. it was extremely tough for two years but he survived because he lived with his parents and right. it became and were easy. you guys making profit or you were just uh, enough revenue to pay for costs? Uh, actually, a little profit. Okay. A little profit. Right. We were paying up enough revenue to pay all the costs and a little more. Uh, but I, I think to make it fully profitable, then we would have to obviously increase the number of members in the center. Now, that would have been a something that we would have to think of later. But then the next year, the, the year after, we opened the second center in a mall in Whitefield. That was very tough. I mean, Indranagar fairly was easy to build in the clientele. Whitefield was very tough. And then the third year, which was just before the acquisition, we opened inside LinkedIn office in Bilandur. And that was a nice setup too, because LinkedIn was very particular about giving their employees a proper gym, a group exercise setup. So we had the whole thing. That was very profitable. Right. Because all we had to do was, they were doing the setup, so, we were running the right. show, getting money. Right. Uh, but yeah, three centers um, in three years. Right. And I, I had told, I remember telling my business partner, we should stop. <laughs> I mean, Why? Uh, I felt the need to be at every center. Mm. You have managers right. running every center. I mean, today I've learned differently from that. Yeah. But I felt like I'm not going to be able to be everywhere connected with members. Right. And I felt like that was super important to be in touch with members, to be in touch with your trainers all the time. So I said, we should stop. But his vision was, no, we should grow. We should get investment. We should expand. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how I'm here. And he's not, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah. Life yeah. moves in a very yeah. unpredictable manner. Absolutely. But I want to also talk to you about in that year 24, 14, 15, you started a group um, training format in Tribe. Around the same time, a little later, Rishabh started Cult, which is also group fitness. I think a bunch of some CrossFit boxes also came. Yes. What was happening? Why was suddenly you know, group fitness starting to happen everywhere in India? I think it was uh, the only way to build stickiness and create a fun concept in fitness. Mm -hmm. Until then, fitness was go to a gym, work out solo, no, not be motivated unless you're self-motivated right. or you have a personal trainer. Uh, that is what everyone spoke about. I paid a gym membership beginning of the year. I've gone for three months and I'm not motivated to go back right. anymore. I have a person trainer. Yes, it's a little fun, but I don't have a buddy to work out with. You know, group concept brought in the whole concept of a workout buddy who's not your real life buddy. Right. Eventually they become, yeah. but you just came into a space where you had people like you. They're also huffing and puffing and finding it difficult. Right. They also have the same issues waking up in the morning and coming, but there is a little bit of accountability. So I feel that accountability factor and the fun factor comes in the group right. does not come when you work out solo in a gym. For gym, you have to have different level of motivation. Yeah. No, the, and, and, th and obviously, you know, I'm a huge believer in group fitness. I yeah. think it's outstanding in terms of the environment and vibe it creates. But why was around that time, like why was everybody studying group fitness, you know, all of a sudden? Correct. That, that That's something, I mean, I, I, I didn't know there was a cult gym in Sarjapur right. and Rishabh didn't know there was a tribe right. in Ranagar, I think. I think we all, and his story is quite similar, right? From a corporate right. and, you know, being an engineer to yeah. moving to this. So I feel like 
some of us did it because we were so passionate about mm -hmm. it. And even the CrossFit box, which was there in Indranagar right. at that point, was also another trainer who was doing very different things. Mm -hmm. And then CrossFit suddenly picked up its momentum. Everyone right. started talking about it and how big it became right. in the US. So they wanted to start looking at yeah. what... Partly I think it's probably maybe inspired for why, why what was happening in the US because this whole concept you know, boutique and group fitness in the you know decade of 2010s yeah. is really took off. A lot of different formats came out. I think it was a little bit of a backlash against, you know, but till that the fitness was mostly either gyms or outdoor running. Yeah. And some ways, you know, both were quite very solo experiences. Yes. And I think yes. people are able to see that in the, I think CrossFit is probably one of the first one yes. to have really started this in a big way. But that, you know, 15, 20 people working out together, it's a very, very different atmosphere. So probably yes. all of us, you know, who got into group fitness got inspired by, you know, what was happening in the yeah. time. So great. So now you've done, you know, try for two years, you've expanded to three centers, you're starting to make some profit, etc. And when, when was the first time you heard about cult? And do you recall what was your initial impression of cult? Yeah, first? so no, so I knew that cult did very different things from tribe. For right. me, cult, the first um, image was MMA, right. you know, like a lot of martial arts based yeah. fitness and not what we were doing at all. So also, we were not in the same space or area, so it was not a competition, but that was my first thing. Then, of course, I heard, you know, about you and you, we all know the name is, is you know, is something that all of us know in the business space. The fact that you're now, you know, you've invested and now it's CureFit and then the whole investment angle came in. And... Like I was saying, my business partner was very keen on, you know, being a part or getting that investment from you. It didn't turn out that way. It became something else. But I was honestly not keen. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm very happy. Okay. Good to know I, that. I'm, I'm finally feel, happy. I feel blessed to be able to learn from you, to be in the same ecosystem. Like I said, be in the ecosystem of a lot of yeah. IMs and IITs and <laughs> learning <laughs> from them. But at that point, honestly, Mukesh, I was like, no, I don't want to go back to, yeah. to the corporate space. Yeah. And, I think know. you're to say that you are not keen. I think is an understatement. I think I want to, you know, the story I'm going to bring up now is so first time we meet in HSR layout yeah. and, you know, me, Ankit, my co-founder at that yeah. time and you, you know, your co-founder and I think there's somebody else also yeah. who had this meeting and then all of you guys basically walk out just suddenly without saying a thing. It wasn't me. <laughs> what happened to you? Oh what? my God. I think I was just following everybody. I had no clue. And I also, I already said it earlier that I'm so bad with numbers and all of this numbers flying through right. with the acquisition thing, it just made me feel so uncomfortable. I'm like, do I really have to be in this right. room? So when they walked out, I just followed and I'm like, okay, is this off? Like, can we stop pursuing all of this? Yeah. It was. Yeah. Yes, I think we are one of the most bizarre experiences I have had, you, you know. We were sitting and talking, having conversation, you know, maybe it can work, maybe it can't, there's numbers. You guys go out, have a huddle, and then you just walk out of the office. Did you, did you then think these these bunch of people who probably don't know what they're I think my only recollection was, I think I just heard great things about Tribe at that time. At Cult also, we were figuring out, you know, how do we grow, expand the team. We had heard great things about you, and I had an overall very favorable impression of the meeting in terms of you know your passion for fitness and I think what you notice is this the cult and tribe was very complimentary I think yes. cult cult was too hardcore at the time yes the things you were doing in you know, your dance and you know crossfit etc was in some ways probably even more relevant yes. so still keen I think I'm glad you know after a few weeks we reconnected and things worked out and I think it's been a phenomenal journey so what but when you guys finally you know decided to for the you know in favor of acquisition was it a difficult decision for you it was. It was very difficult for me more than uh, my business partner. It was very difficult for me because he wanted it to head that direction, except that he exited, right? And of course, he's doing different things and it's he's doing well. But personally, it was not my vision at all. And I was always more a boutique person, one center, run with it for the next five, ten years. Everyone's happy. So I'm like, okay. Am I really doing this? And then I'm like, okay, I think I'll do this because it's Mukesh Bansal. Okay. <laughs> and it's right. going to be epic learning from him. And this is going to be my last thing I do in my life. Right. You know, because... Do you um, still believe all of that? Yes, Mukesh. I okay. mean, you are an inspiration. Sure. Okay. A lot right. of us. 
uh, people don't tell you often and or maybe yeah don't tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you are i mean there's so much to learn from you and i've learned so much like if i redo something now mm-hmm. then it will be very different please don't redo something a long way to go god <laughs> i think things no, are going well <laughs> yeah you do something right like maybe with cult i don't know oh, yeah. but if i if i do then it will be i'll i'll look at it so differently um and all that is because of what i've learned in 7 years of being at cult and it's i can't even imagine that i could be a part of something of this size yeah. you know the the magnitude of this yeah, today you are the fitness icon in the country i mean you and rishabh you guys are really defining fitness for all of india i mean it's a huge platform and i think you guys have also built it right so let's go back now that you know the so cult decide to acquire tribe reluctantly you are so angry to go along with the acquisition and um, how was your journey for for first few years you know did the adjustment take some time etc honestly not because i think the uh, people we were a small team at that point at cult right at at kiofit and it was not difficult at all uh, everyone is amazing rishab and i got along so well I think that made it very easy also uh, because Rishabh and I managed to get along very well wavelength matched we thought the same so even when we you know worked on HRX so worked on anything it was very very similar thoughts so it didn't take time at all yeah i was it, it's like you used the word reluctant again right i i used it in the first time when i, I was reluctant to do zumba right. it turned out to be the best decision of my right. life reluctant to you know go through the acquisition right the next best decision of my life so It was beautiful, and I think what we did in the first two years from growing it, I think we were about four or five centers at right. that point: Sanjapur, Indranagar, right. JP Nagar. From that to what we are today, or in the first two years itself, we grew right. yeah. a lot. Right. I think this is other thing. You know, as per any entrepreneurial journey, you know, serendipity is a huge part. I mean, for example, my, you know, before Kiorford, my previous company, Mintra, we never had the intention of selling the company to anyone. Yes. but at some point you know start align in a way where uh, you know merging with flipkart was the best possible thing you know yes. for mintra and it worked out really well so i think i you know use this phrase you know, i've heard somewhere you know they call it strong opinions loosely held mm. i think for entrepreneurship it works really well you know whatever you are doing you need to really believe it needs to be like really believe you know you are not willing to compromise not willing to do anything but at some point things change the context different at some point you should also be willing to let go and completely reinvent right which clearly would in multiple times right so kind of demonstrated in you know, both side of yeah. strong opinions and loosely held you know multiple times yeah now i get that <laughs> right right so i think so uh, cult you know as we started you know initially i think it took a year or so to figure the product market fit at some point we started growing you are in a big part of the growth and you know slowly slowly zumba started to become pretty big right you know so just kind of talk about that phase of you know, just growing zumba within cult yeah i think um I mean it's again dance and fitness and from my experience of it at tribe or as a freelancer we know it works wonderfully who does not want to come and dance and lose weight right so i think it worked wonderfully and when i did the first class of zumba at cult in jp nagar i remember uh, ankit was a part of it and that time he was in the class and everyone was blown you know who who witnessed it for the first time and like and we had a full class and we knew the skin do really well for us i but the challenges at that point were it's a brand that is not owned by us right. so getting the trainers or doing you know the training locally everything seemed to be a challenge right. because we were the demands from customers were to have more classes yeah. and it was picking up really well and at some point we had to kind of say what do we do next right. do we then connect directly with zumba usa and fix this mm-hmm. have them you know intervene and uh, help us build yeah. which is going to be a very longish right. process because it's still not our brand right yeah. and you have a lot of rules and regulations that's when we said we know it's doing well but can we do something locally and make it equally good or better right and then that discussion of course you know took some time because some of us believe that maybe we should not touch what is going gray yeah which was the year this was 2018 when this thought process started we 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 started in 2017 yeah 2018 okay one and a half two years later is when we yeah 20 second half of 2018 because we started like building we started piloting a little bit 
because we didn't have Bollywood in Zumba. Right. We had Latin, we had English. Maybe sometimes we would just give a touch of Bollywood, and the core format was like that. You know, you only have like one regional song or something. And at that point, regional we used as Bollywood across all cities. Um, and then we realized that when we did a pilot with a lot of Bollywood, it just took off to another level because people really related to it. So we didn't move away from Latin and English. We kept it. But we increased our local stuff, yeah. right? The music and etc. And people could relate to it more. So then we knew. I mean, this is going. To, and then we planned a very gradual phase out because right. there were some hardcore Zumba fans right. among some members. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few of them would have left also because they're like, you know, I want to go to a place that only offers Zumba. Right. Uh, we still have some people like that. Um, but I think the transition. I, and I'll definitely say thanks to you for the support because, you know, at that point, we were growing. The focus was to keep doing what is doing, going well. Right. We didn't want to disturb the setup. Mm -hmm. And had you not, you know, said, yeah, let's pilot, let's experiment, right. maybe I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And if that wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't have Dance Fitness today, which, you know, is so, so critical for us like it's it's an important format as a cardio format like we have our hr accessency and everything which is a great strength format right so similarly i feel like dance for us has worked out as a phenomenal cardio format it just just looking back i think dance is probably the biggest thing that cult has done dance for you know i think today is by far the you know biggest format and the most loved format and the most utilized i mean people really have a blast i keep hearing stories about people who have that dance class and you know when they come out of it you know the word they how they feel when you were creating dance fit what was your thought process like you had certain objectives in mind in terms of you know what you wanted to accomplish in that class yeah uh just actually two things mukesh one was definitely help people burn a lot of calories right. because um a lot of us a lot of people come into walk into a gym not for fun but more for weight loss right. or staying fit and that's the truth, mm -hmm. right? We we know that. So if 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 my format has to do well, and if people have to keep coming back, then it has to give them. There has to be a benefit. Right. right? Second, and this is from my experience of teaching my first class mm -hmm. with that one person. Yeah. The joy. Right. We have so many different formats of exercise today. Mm -hmm. Some workouts make us feel good. It gives right. us a good pump, yeah. etc. Okay, that that endorphin release is always there with everything. But with dance, it's next level. Right. Yeah. Right? That joy you feel at the end of the class is literally inexplicable. And this is not just for someone who can dance, mm. but it's also for a non-dancer. We have right. so many non-dancers who walk into a cult dance fitness, walk out feeling phenomenal, like feel great, right. smiling, that, that excessive sweat trickling down right. their forehead. They feel fantastic. So I felt like two things, joy, you know, joy slash fun, feel good and it can help them you know burn some calories right. burn some fat off right just basically you know delivering um helping people achieve their fitness goals while having a blast like yes. literally it's almost like a party and yes. having you know that yes. club like atmosphere yes. and we have leveraged bollywood in a big way right big way. big way today like i think there are like bollywood like labels reaching out to us and saying you know this is a song we're launching can you launch it in all your centers as a part of your dance fitness class? Can your trainers and everyone create reels around it on social media? So, it, I mean, it's amazing because these songs, when they initially launch, you don't get the license for it and stuff. And if the labels are reaching out to us and saying, can you launch our song? It may not be biggest, but no, we've had like Sony and etc. reaching out for some artists. And some songs. That's amazing. I think so. Cult is a place we want a hit song. Yeah. That's where your song <laughs> needs to be. Okay, good. Be. We'll pursue that. Um, so yes. Right. So yes. part of you know scaling dance fit is also about uh, creating huge pool of dance trainers. Can you talk about that? You know how did we go about recruiting people, training them, and figuring out how can they deliver outstanding you know dance yeah. fitness experience at scale? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mukesh. Uh, it was very challenging in the beginning because we only looked at the Zumba trainers pool to make them dance fitness trainers, and that was a smaller pool. Also, I was mentioning, right, a lot of Zuma fitness trainers were also um, housewives. I'm not saying that they shouldn't train, but there were restrictions. 
in terms of certain timing and etc that we would want them to come and train right so we had quite a lot of challenges initially building the uh, the, the the numbers of uh, trainers the biggest hack for us that in that space was when someone i can't remember who but this was in a discussion said let's get into the dancers pool the dancers who are like let's say hip hop dancers afro dancers street dancers this dancers like that pool or that community is huge in every city in india right and they always look for work that can give them uh, a salary you know because they teach here and there they do some you know workshops their way of making money is very they're like freelancers they don't have a constant source of income and that changed everything for us really? so we then targeted certain you know uh, uh, dancers and dance schools and got that first pool yeah. of trainers from that it was little difficult to train them because they all specialize in one format right. like if you're a hip hop dancer for you to come into bollywood is a right. little difficult yeah but then we built a very strong training format right. and our initial training format was one full month right. versus zumba which was yeah. two days right you know so we created a very strong training format and then after getting the first pool the word went out the entire dance community started talking about hey there is a cult that pays well mm-hmm. and we only have to do te- sessions like for 2 3 hours a day and then you have that breathing space right. you know it's not like you have to sit there and manage mm-hmm. other things you're a trainer you're that's your core job right and then the word was out and then the next time we started like putting out ads for um you know hiring yeah. hiring ads we had like 60 100 people showing up for mm-hmm. auditions right so Excellent. we knew that this is a space mm-hmm. um people need the job people need the steady source of income people need that so all the you know stars started to line up you know dance is obviously very popular at some level bollywood is immensely popular and there is a huge culture of dance both you know classical dance yeah. as well as this newer format but there are a lot of people who will go on to pursue dance a career alternative still not you know that many because there are not that many live performances and so on. so cult kind of you know yeah. the created the you know bridge the gap you know for customers they were able to have a great fun and fitness yes. through dance and the people who were pursuing dance as a hobby or passion it created a no career opportunity right so it worked out for both sides yeah people like all over the country it was so easy for us once we figured that right. this is our hiring strategy yeah. right we're only going to go and find and they're all young boys and girls like they're more enthusiastic they have more energy so it was easy to train them and it was easy to kind of mold them right and you know the way you would want them to present themselves and be right. and etc so okay. that was so shutambri while yes. you know you were building dance fit and recruiting all these trainers and scaling the business you continued getting better and better on your own fitness and at some point you won i think crossfit in india twice in a row yes how did you like that's and i mean i have done crossfit a couple of years it's hardcore is very tough um you know how did you get into crossfit and you know what was the journey like you know from Yeah. getting into crossfit to become basic i think if you win crossfit india you can be called the fittest woman in india yeah. i think that's <laughs> I was, very apt label so yeah just just talk to me about that journey yeah that, that that's also like like zumba and everything else a very uh, happy accident or surprisingly i discovered it thanks to my ex business partner but we had it at tribe mukesh uh, of course we changed it later on we started crossfit at tribe and i remember when we started tribe that place was one of the few boxes in india they call it box right and strong gym so i think we were the second and the third uh, crossfit box and second in bangalore i'm guessing because there was one more in twelve mm-hmm. main at that point um i my um strength journey started with crossfit like i didn't do a lot of strength training i did a lot of dancing in right. and i did yoga but my strength training started with crossfit and thanks to the really good coaches that i got to meet at tribe I absolutely loved the explosiveness that it brings. Mm-hmm. While you're doing a lot of the basic things, you're also doing a lot of movements which are slightly more uh, niche and unique and you need a lot of mobility for it. And I think at that point I was blessed with great mobility, so I ended up performing well. And I did the classes as a part of my strength. And then the open happens once a year, the CrossFit Open competition. Um the coach said you should just give it a shot 
I said, okay, I mean, I'll do what I normally do in class and I'll just put in my all. And it's over five weeks. So each week there's one workout and you get three opportunities to do it. Like, so if you feel like you can do it better, you can basically give a second attempt. And I did it the first year um, and somehow it worked in my favor. And, you know, I think competition is something that I enjoyed. Where were you placed in first year? Fifth. I was the very first time you were yeah. among top five already. Yeah. And it, I felt fantastic to be in that space because that was something new I discovered about right. myself. I'm like, okay, it's there is dance and then there's career in dance. Then there was tribe and all of this happened, which are all very, very new. And I kept discovering this about myself. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I can do this too. Mm-hmm. You know, and it made me feel great. And I must add this here, and it's, it's something that, you know, a lot of women, I don't know, maybe even men will relate. Um, fitness, incorporating fitness, and particularly so strength training, has just made me a lot more confident in life. Mm-hmm. Right. The person that I used to be was more, you know, a little afraid, maybe even afraid of speaking in public or talking to like a big group of people. At HSBC, it was different. It was your team. Right. Your team is like, becomes like your family over the years. So you're comfortable. But generally, I was not someone who was capable of being extremely social. I was mm-hmm. afraid. I'd love it. Right. I'd love to do it. And I think fitness has changed that for me. Doing Zumba and then, you know, excelling in uh, CrossFit and picking up a lot of weights. For a woman... I feel like it just suddenly makes you feel like, oh, you know, stronger. Right. Mentally. Physically, mm-hmm. of course, you will get stronger. So I remember like a, a, a big shift in my head that happened after winning that first CrossFit Open. I'm like, I'm so much more than I think I am. Right. You know, I mean, we all feel like there's certain things that we're good at. Certain things we'll be average or not good at. But until you try, you really don't know it. What are your different potential and capabilities? So then I I, I, I did that and then next year again I competed and uh, then I, you know, became the third fittest. Uh, so I came up. So fifth to third? Third. To probably winning next year. Next year I didn't do it okay. because then, you know, we got really busy. So third is where I stopped. But that's the year that you gave me a little gift for winning. <laughs> uh, you gave me a Spider-Man. Right. And I still have it. Excellent. And, you know, I look at it and obviously there's lots of memories, but I still do CrossFit in my own capacity in a sense, not, you know, the certain aspects of it I still keep. It's not like I only train CrossFit, mm-hmm. but certain aspects I don't, which are not really needed for your general fitness and longevity and everything. But it really changed my perspective. Um, so today I just promote the fact that everybody should lift weights. Everybody right. should exercise to begin yeah. with. But... Looking at my mom, what she's going through, despite being very active, today she's dealing with Parkinson's. Looking at my father, despite being so active, he is going through, uh, he has heart disease, has diabetes, recently gone through cancer. When I look at all of this, I'm like, you know what, the more you strengthen yourself yeah. mentally, emotionally, physically, for old age, right, yeah, the better you will now you're talking about some of my favorite topics, you know, about fitness. You know, I think the relationship between physical fitness and mental, you know, fitness is uh, mental wellness is not talked about that much. But every form of workout, you know, makes you feel so much better about yourself. And it's a great stress buster. It gives you ability to focus and just deal with, you know, all the things, all the stressors that we deal with. And can you even, you know, play a um, huge role in our you know, emotional well-being. So that's one part. Second, you know, this, the boost in confidence yes. that once you go and slay that workout and do really well, you know, even if, you know, something today you feel you can't do and then tomorrow you are able to do that, that's the boost in confidence. It applies to pretty much all walks of your life. Yes, and I want to add something very small. It may sound silly, but for the longest time, right, I was very conscious about being short, you know. And in my family, like my sister, younger sister is way taller than I am. And... I think for the for a long time, I always stepped out of the house wearing heels because I wanted to feel tall. And it's only after I brought fitness into my life that I felt so comfortable in my own skin. I felt so confident of who I am that I literally don't wear heels anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm always, you know, very comfortable. I, I don't 
it doesn't bother me how I am perceived because right. I know how mentally, physically, emotionally strong I am, mm-hmm. and that's all that matters. All right. No, amazing. You know, this is uh, and probably you feel more comfortable all day, not having to wear yeah. heels, right? Yeah, I'm comfortable. Yes. Right. And and I know it's very small, Mukesh, but I know I know a lot of women who go through the same, you know, image, right? right. I mean, and I think women go through it probably a little more than men, or I know so. Mm-hmm. But that that's another reason why I tell all women. I said, forget about you know, how you feel, I mean, um, because of the way the outside world or someone else is perceiving about you, one of the things that can change for you when you start exercising right. consistently is feel great about right. you, feel strong, feel positive. Feel right. Like- so you have, you know, broken a lot of stereotypes in your last, you know, 20 year career. Um, just I won't go back to CrossFit for one more minute. Um, for, I think a lot of people may not be aware of CrossFit, you know, when you were competing in, let's say, the year that, you know, you yeah. placed, you were the number one women athlete in the country. Just give a sample of a workout, you know, what does the, mm-hmm. a typical CrossFit workout, you know, during those challenges look like? Because I want to ask a follow-up question you know, after you give just one example. Okay, so I'll give, I'll, I'll give a, a workout that sounds simple, but two exercises that are literally, okay, I'll use the word hate. I don't use the word hate <laughs> often because it's very strong, but... These are two movements which are hated by most people. Burpee Mm -hmm. and thrusters. Right. You know, a thruster is where, you know, we're holding really heavy weights. You're squatting, you're standing up and pushing up overhead. And it's all for volume. You're Mm -hmm. talking about X number of burpee, X number of thrusters going back to back for X number of Right. I mean, that's one workout I cannot get out of my system because I wanted to throw up in the middle of it. But you can't stop because you lose time. And then you have like five people around you, like pushing you and just chasing you to say you cannot stop, you know, in, and you, you at that point, you just hate them because they don't know what you're going through. All they're doing is standing around you and cheering you. That was one of the toughest war, just thruster burpee, two movements. But when you repeat that for volume over and over again, you don't know where your heart is or head is. You have no idea. You remember how many repetitions of burpees and thrusters you did? I'll have to go back okay. and check Mukesh because this is a while ago. But uh, but then when I finished it, of course, I went, ran to the washroom, I threw up and etc. Uh, and then when, when you see the leaderboard, when you see your name on top, you're like, it's just worth it. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, quite it's, challenging, you know, I, you know, having done some CrossFit, you know, basically there is almost no rest time. Yes. And you optimize for time, you're trying to squeeze in as many repetitions possible. So you go all out. Uh, with weights, right? So, the yeah, like you're, I'm sure weights. your thrusters must be at least probably 30 or 40 kg, yes, I'm guessing, you know, in yes, that range. Yes. And you're doing this, you know, movement continuously. And that I wanted to ask you about typically, you know, when most women get into fitness, they don't think as much about strength workout. Mm. Dance, yoga is something, you know, is very comfortable and most women will go into. But you have, I mean, you also started with dance. At some point, you became hardcore strength training. Yes. You know, what is your just, personal experience and your recommendation for you know women in general to think you know how should they think about strength yeah. conditioning in their life i think first and foremost thing and probably the only thing to keep in mind you incorporate strength training to age gracefully it's as simple as that mukesh for me it's just that most people are literally fall off their chair when i tell them i'm 43 i know some part of it is genetics you know to like maybe look a certain way or whatever but this is my hard work. You know, I wake up every day at 5 a.m. and I show up because I want to look a certain way and more than look, I want to feel a certain way. When I, when my daughter turns 20, I'll be 60. And if I don't have the same energy that I have today, I'll feel miserable about it. I want to feel, you know, have the same energy to go wherever she wants to go. And I generally want to age gracefully. So I feel like Looking at my mother and a lot of my aunts back home, they've been so active, doing all the household chores, etc, etc. But now they don't have the strength to walk properly. You know, so I think the fundamental, I mean, those years were different. Everyone would say after 60, old age sets in, so you're going to have aches and pains. But I think it's very different. I mean, I I look at women who are 80 doing uh, 80 kg deadlift, you know, not in this country, a different country, but... Why can't we incorporate that for our women? Make them more independent at 80. You know, at 90, there are women picking up weights and, you know, doing sit-ups. I'm like, if they can do it at that age. I know these are one-off maybe. There are too many doing it. No, but they're inspiring examples. They're so inspiring. when when you are 80, you're doing 80 kg deadlift? Yes, Mukesh, I will be. And that's my goal because 
it's not only me teaching my daughter the right thing but there are so many today there are 25 year old and 26 year old girls who if i had a child at the right age it should probably be 25 what i'm saying these kids come up to me when i'm maybe at a coffee shop or something and say that you know what we follow you on instagram you're very inspiring for me that's a huge win because i'm not just inspiring women of 35 40 45 mm-hmm. but i'm able to actually let a 25 year also think the importance of weight training right and that's my core goal no no i'm glad you're talking about it i think you know while in this podcast you know core focus on impact but one of the things you know themes yeah. i will keep repeatedly talking about the role of fitness yeah. because fitness does so many good things yes. in your life and that creates a platform for you to be able to inspire for bigger things you know have that confidence have that mental peace you know have that stamina and longevity right yes. and um, i also agree with you the importance of weight training from a, when it comes to muscle building because you know having certain muscle mass for a long period of time yes. is one of the biggest predictor predictor of longevity you know if you want to age gracefully yes. and have strength and less injuries etc you need to has started and more muscle mass and strength training is by far the best method to get yes. there and i must add this every doctor has told my mother i can't give you a medication for parkinsons because there isn't one right a uh, sinopar is the only one that gives you some dopamine release mm-hmm. when you take the tablet they're like you have to exercise right you know you need to cycle one of the best thing to do is boxing or that kind right. of stuff i'm not going to get a 70 year old to box you know and that to someone who right. thinking is very old school and etc so i got her a cycle mm-hmm. but i'm it's not like exercise the answer to everything but in parkinson's it's a case of dopamine release right. yeah. when you work out figuring out balance and coordination by doing certain things like dance and boxing and all of those things right so again coming back to just last bit is like that's what mukesh it's about for me today it's about managing your hormone health right women that's what you need to worry about mm-hmm. Uh, you know after 40s like you need to you get into the perimenopausal stage and menopause stage and etc so one is hormone health the other is muscle mass and your joint functionality if you want these two things to be in great place as you age and aging is inevitable right you have to pick up weights and i'm not saying pick up heavy weights that's to each one's body type and ability need everything pick up some weights light weights are heavy but you should be lifting weight what, how do you manage your hormonal health do you do any tests you know what is your method of managing it yes so i do my regular tests every 6 months and that's something my dad taught me at a very young age because he does it every 6 months and he ensured the whole family did it and we keep a track and apart from that i also have a functional medicine specialist who i normally show my reports to and uh, he tells me on how to supplement when to get off when to keep it on and now okay there are so many amazing tests in the market like i've done my genetic test i'm not saying that everything is 100% accurate and i'm sure you also will you know have some uh, school of thought on these but some just few days ago i came across a test um this place called nura something the report basically even identifies you know if you potentially have a block in your heart right. right like it's so detailed so detailed and then based on that report you can then go and you know get an angiogram done if you need or more do, do more detailed uh, tests especially in times where very young ones are dying out of heart attack and yeah. all of that i don't know maybe this right. this kind of data is just so data is available i do i do a lot of tests myself but getting it read by the right person is important I do my body composition analysis to check that my fat percentage is within a certain range. Women should not be bringing it too low unless you're an athlete of mm-hmm. so, some sort and you're doing it supervised. So I want I don't want to bring it too low where my hormones mess up and all of that. So I maintain it at a certain point looking a certain way, maintain muscle mass. That's great to hear. Energy. I'm, right, absolutely. You know, I do the same thing. I have, you know, I very religiously test lot of bio parameters in yes. every 3 months or 6 months. to just keep track of you know what's happening with my body and you know, what across sleep or nutrition or fitness need to change at some point i think we'll do very deep episode in this uh, series yes. to go into because it's a whole new world out there about the kind of tests that are available kind of supplements that are available and so on but some of them i think is relevant to pretty much everyone because you know the 
the science of health has advanced so much. I think, and we'll try our best in this podcast to try to talk about yeah. that in more detail. I want to go back to your fitness routine. You have mentioned a few times. You get up at five in the morning. You are in gym by what? Five thirty-six. Yeah. Five. So there was a time where I also I woke up at four fifteen, four thirteen, Mukesh. This was when I was running very aggressively. Uh, so because running typically happens early morning when there are no vehicles on the road, right? But now because I've reduced my running, I wake up at five. By five thirty, five forty, I'm at the gym. I have a, of course, this again comes with age. I have a longish warm up process because I, I've hurt myself not badly, but a little bit here and there. And post that, I've re- realized that mobility. You have great mobility, but it's not going to stay with you forever. So you need to work on it. So I spend a good thirty to forty minutes just warming up. You know, right from foam rolling to multiple things. Spend about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes doing my workout, and I do strength training every day. Every day I lift weights, then a little cardio. I ensure I walk. That whole step concept is one, you know, ten thousand, twelve thousand. But um, I walk every day. Somehow I get in twelve, fifteen thousand steps. Minimum is ten. All right. And I do that because I commute, like house to the gym, even right. if it's a little distance. I'll ensure I walk mm-hmm. back and forth. Um, and then I do a fairly decent recovery, recovery as in like a stretch. But what I realize also is the stretch that you do post a workout yeah. doesn't do much. You know, mm-hmm. it can only do so much. Your recovery has to be right. stronger than that. You know, the the every once in two weeks the release that you do, right? Uh, the foam rolling that you do before right. going to bed. Mm-hmm. I feel all of these little things takes about five ten minutes only can help you recover better, stay in the game for longer. Right. So you spend almost like ninety minutes to even two hours two in the gym. Hours, two, two hours. Two hours in the gym every day. You every take single day. All seven days a week. Sundays I don't. Okay. Today uh, I didn't do morning, but I'll do something you know, right. later this evening because you know I, I was doing this. But uh, Sundays I normally try to just stick to walking right. or just doing a lot of the household stuff that we mm. do on Sunday itself. Right. Just takes you to that number of steps. So I don't. Right. So you mix, you know. A lot of emphasis on mobility and slow warm up. Yes. Focus on strength training, lifting weights, yes. some cardio, and then just being active throughout the day throughout through the day. this ten, twelve thousand steps. On top of it, some recovery protocol, both in the gym as well as all time, you know, bed. before going to bed, etc. Right? Yeah. The active part, Mukesh, I don't like. Like, I don't always consciously make an effort to say, "Oh, I have to go for a walk now." Post a meal, run, go for a walk. That's probably not possible for anyone. But I, what I want to give a message to everyone is, if you can, this is what I've incorporated. It works wonderfully. Like how you know you got up every forty-five minutes. You just want to get up and move around. If we can incorporate that in our daily life, which is totally doable, everyone are get up and walk for two minutes. That is enough for, you know, some sort of blood flow, circulation for your joints to you know feel good and etc. The problem is most of us sit and take calls and we. Just sit down for long hours. So I tell people start with the basic. Don't beat yourself self up over going to a gym. Right. If you cannot, you cannot. Okay, you'll figure out at some point. Move. Right. You cannot tell me that you can't walk or you can't move around. You know, around the house, outside the houses. Start with simple stuff. Absolutely, that's incredible. I think you know your um, commitment to fitness. I think it's an inspiration to both men and women alike. I think it's a. Just too important for anyone to not take it seriously, and I agree with you. You know, any kind of movement is fine. You know, walk, run, cycle, swim, yeah. hike. You know, go to gym, group class, whatever. It all form of movement work. But I think this has been a great, you know, conversation, Shudambri. I think you know your journey is phenomenal. I think you have done outstandingly well as an entrepreneur. You have created new things from scratch. You know, dance fit is kind of you know your legacy. And now you are continuing the work of you know inspiring you know huge number of people by being a role model yourself. You are out there, you know, you live authentically, you know, to uh, doing justice to really everything. Your personal health, your career, your family. You are able to balance it, you know, and have a method to do that. And you are also very transparent and share public with how you are doing it. I think a lot of people of all ages look up to you, and I think it's a it's a you know privilege also to work with you. I think the work we are doing at Cult is phenomenal and. Uh, I immensely enjoyed this conversation. It was great to have you on this. Thank you so much, Mukesh. Honestly, a lot of what I do on social, like I was telling you earlier, I'm not a very social. I never used to be a social person, but I became that person. Uh, on social media, particularly, I want to say this, you know, as a, a closing point. 
I do it because a lot of people have written to me saying that when you just put that one image of yours after a workout that you got it done yeah. makes us get up from our chair or bed or wherever we are and makes us move you know and as much as sometimes there are days I don't want to do it you know you don't want to just put your life on social media always but I realize I'm in it to help people I started this journey of fitness many years ago with that one student because I wanted to bring joy and health and happiness to as many people as I can Cult has made it happen with many, many thousands of people. Otherwise, I'd have probably touched the lives of hundreds. So I'm always grateful and thankful for cult. But now this beautiful social media can be looked at as a negative thing and a positive thing. It depends on how you look at it and what you, you know, take and give. And I think for me, that's become a very important channel to really help people, right. like right from listening to our podcast and yeah. <laughs> helping more people. Right. Yeah, you know? of course. All tools have positive and negative. Yes. But I think it depends on what you're using it for. I think you are doing a phenomenal job. You should definitely continue. I think the more we promote the message of fitness yes. and also really inspire and enable a lot more women in India to take up you know, ambitious projects, create a huge impact in whatever walk of life is relevant for them. I think it will be better for the country as a whole. Yes. But a super fun to talk to Shay. I think. Uh, Same here, Thank yeah. you so much for just having me here. I think this was one of the best conversations I've had in seven years. Oh, wow. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. You've been my day. I'm day. still learning how to do this podcast. So I'm still, you know, not for my group, but having any No, but you asked me all, like so many things which just took me from literally the time I started my life to where I am today. And I think yeah, yeah well, your life is super inspirational. I think the story needs to be told, and I hope you know. I'm sure a lot of people will find a lot of cues from this conversation to probably apply in their life. So once again, thank you. Thank you. At Sparks, we aim to bring to you stories of exponential impact. We share in-depth analysis of what goes behind success stories. If you find our conversations interesting, you can join us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also listen to Sparks on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or any other audio platform of your choice. If you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve and keep getting better as we go along.